Okay, welcome to the second session of today. Um, this one's two years of paid work and contributions to the Debian long-term support project. Um, Raphael will be talking about his experiences, so enjoy. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to present the Debian long-term support project. Uh, I did a similar presentation last year. So if you already saw it, uh, there is a first part that is quite common. But I wanted to put some emphasis on what we did to avoid problems uh, related uh, to our usage of money to pay contributors. Because this is somewhat, somewhat controversial topic, or it used to be at least. And uh, I want to share my experience uh, here. So. So let's start, uh, we'll go quickly through the slides because uh, I have many of them. And I'll slow down at the end to discuss, to show the new content and the changes since last year. So what is LTS about? It's about providing five years of security support to all Debian releases, thus allowing users to skip a release. So basically, you, if you're using Debian 7 from start to end, you can then switch directly to Debian 9. What were the, the challenges? Well, five years of security support is a lot of work. It means multiple releases, maintaining multiple releases at the same time. And our security team has limited resources and aims to support all architectures. So it's difficult for them to do it. In order to achieve this, we restricted the perimeter. That is, we only support a subset of the architectures, and we excluded some problematic packages. Here's a, a link. There's a list and a link of the full, with the full list below. But, uh, the slides should be available on the top page soon. Uh, we decided to create a long-term support team, which is separate from the security team. Also, there are members which, a few members are part of both teams. And that allowed us to have different policies and different inf infrastructure. <coughs> we wanted to make it possible for companies to help us because, well, companies are the first users of uh, long term support. Once they deploy a server, they want to continue to use it as long as possible. Uh, and still keeping it secure, obviously, because many people, many companies were already keeping servers longer than usual, but they were not covered uh, security-wise. So what we did uh, is that we, well, basically announced it and said, whoever wants to help us can help us. Here's a list of people that you can, you can pay, but in practice, to pay to, to help us doing, doing security updates. But in practice, uh, most of the contributors who wanted to be paid uh, uh, joined together and created a common offer that is managed by my own company, uh, Friction. So what do we do at Friction? We collect money from sponsors. So we have almost 40 sponsors by now. Uh, then we convert this money in work hours, and we dispatch those work hours over all the contributors which are participating. At the end of the month, each contributor is supposed to provide a report of what he did, and based on this report, we pay his invoice. There is a difference in the rate that we use uh, to to pay contributors and the rates that uh, sponsors pay. That covers the administra administrative cost and the management cost of uh, paid contributors. A few words about the uh, workflow of the LTS team. So basically, the triage work is done uh, together with the security team in the security tracker, which is common to both teams. New issues are added to a text file. They are dispatched on source packages. And then each team reviews the status of each CVE 
for uh, each release. And we classify the issue in different cases. So one possibility is that, well, the issue is real. We need to fix it. So we then add an entry to another file, which is called DLA needed. Txt. Another possibility is that, well, the issue does not apply to whatever we have in this release. So it's not affected, the tag that you put in the file. A third possibility is that, uh, well, the software is no longer supported. Uh, we decided uh, we could not support it, so we tag it end of life. Or maybe the issue is not severe enough, uh, not worth fixing. It would take too much time for too little benefit. And then it's take no DSA. Well, DSA is for Debian security announcement or advisory, but, uh, but we have another word uh, in for, for the LTS team, which is DLA, but we still use the same tag, obviously, because the tracker is common. And the last possibility is that uh, the bug was real, but it was already fixed in a former version. So basically, we can ignore it. And we, in this case, we put the fixed version uh, as uh, data. Uh, we always try to keep the maintainers in the loop because uh, they can jump in and do the work by themselves. This is a short uh, extract of uh, this data CVE list file. So you can see uh, well, it's uh, an old entry for squeeze, no longer for wizard, enough, I know, but well, this is not very interesting. So when you decide to that the issue is worth fixing, you you have to find a patch. You have to backport it, if required. And you prepare a new upload with a plus dev 7 u one suffix, for example. Well, that's the usual workflow that packagers should know. Then you test the update, and you upload it. Testing is not always trivial. It's actually one of, one of the hardest parts uh, for, uh, in the security workflow because we modify many packages that we're not familiar with. And uh, not all packages have uh, DEP8 test suite. Uh, and sometimes the, the setup of the software is rather hard. It takes a lot of time. If you are unsure, you can always uh, seek an, an external review of the members on the team. With, uh, by sending a depth diff on the list. But if you're pretty sure, then you can directly upload to Wizzy Security. Once the upload has been made, you have to announce it. And we have a small script, again DLA, which generates a textual report that you can then send with uh, MUT or whatever mailer you, you use. In this process, uh, uh, there's some data recorded, which, is, which will update the security tracker, uh, telling, indicating that, uh, well, this issue is fixed in this version of the package. Some statistics about the team. I updated those for, to cover now two years. So, the number of uploads that we made over two years is more than 500. And uh, I try to classify those by uh, affiliation. That is, well, which company sort of sponsored the, the work, or which group or team, or, and also by individual contributor. So the paid contributors uh, really have done most as you see, because Friction is the company which collects the sponsorship, so it's actually many sponsors. And uh, no, no affiliation, is, it means, uh, well, package maintainers made the upload by themselves, so they are the second largest contributor, if you, may, if you want. We have many people carrying, many Debian maintainers caring about their own packages in LTS, and that's good. 
And the third largest is the security team itself. We have two or three members of the security team which he, who are working on the LTS team as well from time to time. Sometimes because uh, uh, the fix is really the same in JT and Wizi, so it's not a lot of work to, to do both at the same time. And then we have a few other companies. Electricité de France is uh, doing some internal LTS support even before LTS existed, so they contribute a few. <laughs> But basically, uh, the paid contributors are nowadays faster than their internal support, so they're not doing much anymore. Credative is actually maintaining PostgreSQL through Christoph Berg. And then, well, we have a few other sponsors, but most of them uh, are actually no longer active nowadays. Toshiba used to have someone helping us, but they, they are now becoming a platinum sponsor instead. And so there are no longer any individual working directly. Univention was because uh, Moritz Mulenov was uh, employed by them, but uh, he switched jobs, so he's no longer doing it. If you look in the contributor list, uh, the Eight, eight first are people paid by Frixon. Tish is a member of the security team. Guido is paid uh, as well. Kurt, Kurt is the maintainer of OpenSSL. He's doing his uh, reload of his own package. So clearly the, the list is dominated by paid contributors. Uh, this is a, a chart trying to show the number of uh, LTS upload done over time. Uh, the blue part is uh, paid contributors. The somewhat dark part here is uh, maintainers taking care of their own packages. But you can see that, well, over time, so somehow the paid contributors are becoming really uh, almost the only workforce, or the largest workforce. The small. Uh, Drop here is just uh, because, well, uh, from February to May, uh, Squeeze LTS was no longer supported, and uh, Wizi was still supported by the security team. So uh, the paid contributors actually helped the security team, but it's not keeping track. My statistics were not keeping track of this. Here you can see the evolution of the number of sponsored hours. So it has been uh, slowly growing from the start up to now. We are now at 135 hours per month. And we're likely to get another platinum sponsor soon. So we're relatively close of our goal of funding uh, the equivalent of a full-time position. Uh, the red line is the number of uh, paid contributors. And you can see that it's... Uh, as the more hours we add, the more pet contributors came on board. I also give some figures about uh, the, the, the various level of sponsorship. It's relatively balanced. So this is the, the start of the new content, really, because the, the last slides were updated from last year, but now we're going to speak about something more interesting. So we recently switched from Squeeze to Easy as the long-term support version. Uh, we made some changes at this point. Uh, instead of using uh, Squeeze LTS, which was a separate repository, we're now using the Wizi security repository, which is hosted on security.debian.org. So that means users do not have any do not have to change their sources list, uh, dot list file, and they get their security updates like usual. It means so some changes for contributors. Well, we have to upload to uh, another repository. And there are some downsides uh, due to not so good integration of security.debian.org with other tools like uh, package.debian.org, which is not showing them, or not in a timely way. 
with the switch to Wizy, we also tried to support more packages, mainly virtualization related, so Xen, QMU, and so Firefox, which is a desktop browser. As you know, IceDob, LibAV, LibVirt, Zabbix, all those were, were not supported in Squeeze and are now supported in Wizy, or at least to some extent. This is all made possible because, well, as I said before, the amount of sponsorship uh, growed over time, so we have the means to do this. We also added two new architectures, a bit lately, but uh, we are now supporting ARML and ARM HF. In fact, it came at a request of our new sponsors that joined lately. Uh, sponsor is Platome, and it's uh, they are uh, doing RM, RM board, and their customers wanted to keep using Wizzy, so they are now a, a gold sponsor, I, I think. And um, well, FTP masters and Buildy maintainers have been uh, receptive to our request, and uh, in the last day before Wizzy had just started, uh, well, we added those architectures. We are also trying to work with external partners because uh, the skill set in the pet contributors is somewhat uh, limited and there are st uh, some packages which are really uh, hard to support when, he, when they are no longer supported by their upstream communities. And so we, we reached out uh, to a few uh, companies and individuals. Uh, so we have two such cases currently. One is uh, Xen, and we picked Creative to to maintain a, a sort of upstream Xen branch that we can uh, use in Wizzy. And so far, it's Bastian Blank who has been doing uh, the work. And the other case is LibAV with uh, Diego Burun. Uh, I don't have any feedback yet here because he did not do anything yet. Um, well, this is really an experiment. We are not yet. We, we don't have a, a good workflow yet to work with uh, external partners. We're trying. We're trying things out uh, right now. <laughs> So, how do we try to avoid money-related problems? There are several points that I will uh, detail to tomorrow. One is about transparency, both towards the external community, I mean Debian at large, and also internal, I mean between the set of pet contributors. And we have clear rules to join the set of pet a set of pet contributors. We have rules to allocate hours, and we have rules uh, related to how we communicate. And I made sure that there was a way to complain about what we do, so that if people are unhappy, they can do, uh, they can tell us, tell us. So, external transparency. Uh, Friction, that is me. I'm doing monthly reports of, the, of how we used the hours that we were sponsored, that were sponsored. So I document uh, the hours given to each contributors, and I put link to their respective res, their respective report. And I try sometimes to do some high-level analysis of. Uh, what happened uh, in the LTS world and the, how, how the funding involved and stuff like that. The report includes a list of sponsors. It's, it's a way to bring them some visibility because the report is uh, posted on Planet Debian. Each pet contributor must do a, a report of its own, and they must document what they did and how many hours they worked. Some do it on their blog, which might be syndicated or not on Planet Debian, and others are doing it 
with a simple mail to the Debian LTS mailing list. <coughs> Internal transparency. So, uh, the bad contributors have access to a private Git repository where I document uh, which sponsor paid and uh, how much, obviously, and how it's converted into work hours. So, we're using Ledger, the common light thingy, and it works with a text file, uh, which looks like this. This is an entry, uh, it's a double entry accounting system. So, basically, uh, we record on one side, uh, we have a set of bounded hours, and we dispatch them to, well, this will give us two hours in July and August, uh, etc. Because when you pay an amount, well, it depends if you pay uh, a yearly amount, uh, we dispatch the award over the full year. But if you subscribe in a qu quarterly way, then we obviously dispatch the awards only over the quarter. Every first of the month, I uh, dispatch again all the available hours to individual contributors. This is what it looks like here for the entry, for the last June entry. Uh, well, uh, so we have separate accounts for each uh, contributor. Each contributor can set uh, a limit on the number of hours that he wants to be assigned, which explains why uh, some have different amounts. Guido, for example, always never wants more than eight hours, so as we had more than eight hours per contributor, he has only eight and others have more. And at the end of the month, uh, the contributors must do, must add its own entry saying, well, okay, I had so many hours, but uh, well, I did them all and I, wa I want to be paid for them, okay, or I could not did do them all. In, the, uh, in which case it keeps a few hours for the months after. And you must document here the, the link where we can find these reports. We have uh, open rules to join. This has been documented on the friction.com website since the start. Basically, you have to be involved in Debian already as a developer or as a maintainer. You must have some prior experience with security updates. That said, it can be on your own package, and it doesn't mean it doesn't have to be a very long experience. But you must be familiar with uh, the process. You must have good programming skills because, well, uh, you will have to deal with packages that you don't know in programming languages, in multiple programming languages, so the more you know, the better. And if you're really not able to, to work with uh, programming languages that you don't know, then you're not going to be very useful in this project. You must be able to emit invoice to friction, so this is mostly an administrative reason. And you must accept some rules. Uh, as I said, you have access to a private Git repository with some data about our customers or sponsors. And uh, so you must respect the privacy of this. You must commit to do a public monthly report. You must follow the Debian Code of Conduct. Uh, to which I add, you have the obligation to respond to queries from other Debian contributors. Uh, you, I don't want pe paid people to be uh, non-responsive. I mean, it's not because you are paid that you are not part of a community that you can allow yourself to not uh, respond or to ignore other people. And last point, uh, it's something else. You must do your best to, to do as well or better than the Debian security team is already doing or has already been, has already been doing on, with the release that we maintain. How do we allocate uh, hours. So the basic rules is that we split evenly between all contributors which are registered. 
But as I said, you can define a maximal number of hours, so then in which, which case uh, we, will we will have differences. If we have too many active contributors, this never happens so far, then we would organize a rotation so that we do not assign less than eight hours per contributor because while well, a security update can be involved and uh, you must be able to do it from start to finish. And if we have only three hours per month, uh, it doesn't make much sense. And it would also be a, an administrative headache for us to add, handle too many very small invoices. As I uh, showed before, the number of contributors has grown together with the number of paid hours, which is a good thing. This means that, uh, well, uh, each paid contributor only has a limited number of uh, paid hours. Uh, I do not want to get into the situation where we would have uh, uh, one paid contributor relying only on LTS for his life or for his income or for his. And it also means that we would have more redundancy. Uh, if you, if only one contributor is doing all the work, uh, then if he goes ill, you're in a problematic situation. But here, we can uh, uh, smooth things up. And it happened quite often that, uh, well, for various reasons, one of the pet contributors did not manage to do his hours, so we, we have been able to redispatch uh, re them to others quite easily. So we have also communi clear communication rules. Mm, I think I already covered those mainly. Uh, obviously, uh, we want to respect the Debian code of conduct. And uh, well, it's one of those cases where you, uh, the consequences are rather clear, uh, and you have something real to lose. So. Um, also, yes, we always make sure to involve the current package maintainers when we handle uh, LTS updates. Uh, it can be tempting to do everything ourselves immediately because while well, we have paid, we have some time. Uh, but uh, it's important to not in your the usual process and offer the maintainer to do it by himself because well it means we can spend more time on other neglected package where we would not have the re the resource and also because well it's a more inclusive way to work and as i said before you have uh, an obligation when you are a paid contributor to respond to queries from other paid contributors I mean, lack of communication is uh, hardly acceptable in a, for volunteers, but for pay, for paid contributors, it's clearly not acceptable. So that's why I added this rule. Uh, last point: the friction.com web page has a uh, Q wait, Q and A or section, if you want, and. Uh, there uh, I document if you have a, what you should do if you have a problem. Basically, it's come talk to me and tell me what is not uh, good, either in the work of some paid maintainer or in the process, but uh, at least there is a clear point of contact. Uh, because we want to be recognized for the high quality work that we're doing, and we don't want to to be badly seen. I mean, w when you do paid work, it must be uh, something good. We had no complaints so far, at least no official complaints. I don't know if any have heard of any, then feel free to come talk to me. But, but somewhat preventively, <laughs> I do complain from time to time to some of the pet contributors. 
uh, not in an aggressive manner, in a constructive manner, but uh, when I have the feeling that one of the contributors is not uh, up to par in terms of quality of his work or uh, in terms of commitment, uh, I, I will say what I have to say. Uh, for example, w one common problem is that, uh, well, most of the pet contributors are contractors, uh, self-employed people, and uh, they have customers that call them, they have urgencies, and they take LTS as a side project, that, well, maybe I have time, it would be nice if I could, okay. but at the end of the month, I did, oh, well, I did nothing. But that's bad, because really, if you uh, requ request work hours, uh, you take a commitment. Okay, this month I will spend 10 or 15 hours because I care about LTS and because I know that there are uh, companies relying on my work and which need uh, security update, timely security updates. So it's a bit hard for people, but uh, you have to organize yourself to be able to, sp to spend multiple, multiple time per month, uh, a few hours, because you, it's not like a project where you can sit down in the morning and uh, have it finished by the evening. Uh, usually security updates uh, take some interaction with others, so you have to be able to spend a little bit of time over multiple days in the months. And actually some pet contributors realized that they were not keeping up to what to the expectations and they stepped down by themselves after a while. So, lessons learned. I believe it's possible to pay Debian contributors without disrupting the entire community. I think, well, the experience shows that LTS is now a project uh, which is two years old. We have been paying uh, quite a few people and uh, the world did not end yet. <laughs> but care must, must be taken at many levels. Uh, as I said, you must work transparently and in an inclusive way. You must avoid that someone gets locked in a pet position. You must have fair criteria to use the money, or at least a fair chance of being paid. And you must be aware that it will have consequences. Uh, when, you, when there are volunteers working in, in a field, and if you inject bad contributors there, there might be uh, volunteers who will use this opportunity to ch change their own priorities. Because if they see that someone else is already taking care of this, uh, they will find something another neglected area where they can do a, a difference, for, for instance. So, that's it. I'm here to answer your question, and I invite you also to join uh, my boss this afternoon, at uh, 2 o'clock, about uh, using Debian money to fund Debian projects, because I built this... Uh, presentation as an introduction to the buff, showing that, well, it's possible to use money and are there other interesting ways to use money to fund Debian projects in Debian? I believe so, and I would like to discuss it uh, with all of you. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> By the uh, can the pet contributors stand up to, so that others can identify them and join? There are a few of them. Yes. Okay, thank you, guys. If you have questions, you can uh, come see me or there as well, if, I, if you fear me. <laughs> and if you have questions now, I'm here. Hi. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, could you speak to the bus factor of LTS in the sense of if for some reason you had to disappear? Oh, uh, yeah, what would, what would happen to the project? I mean, have you thought about that? Um, not really, no. Is I'm it, still quite young, even if I'm getting older. But 
Uh, I don't have any answer for this. Uh, there's my wife, which is also involved the, in the company. So if something happens to me, uh, the company will be managed by her. But I um, don't know uh, how it would look like afterwards. Uh, but probably one of one good reason to integrate it back into Debian. <laughs> yeah. But. So regarding new contributors, um, do you expect people to come to, towards you or do you ask people if they would be interested? Uh, for example, you know people you think would do a good job or how does it usually work? I've done both. Uh, at the start, I, uh, well, it started with a simple mail to Debian LTS. So there were also Debian people interested who joined. But over time, uh, I published it more and more widely in order to get more people. Uh, once on Plaid Debian and once on Debian jobs. And, uh, so I fully, uh, it's documented publicly, so I fully expect people to come to me by themselves. But since uh, I had not enough people uh, coming by themselves, I, I, I voluntarily adv advertised it broadly, more broadly. And I made a few requests here and here when I knew of people who were uh, self-employed and I would be a good fit. It happened. I also once asked Antonio uh, specifically for someone of uh, South America because, well, most paid contributors are Euro European right now, but there's no reason for this. And I wanted to get a bit more div diversity uh, in terms of, well, time zone because for security updates it can be interesting and uh, also just general diversity. Okay, so also uh, related to the bus factor question, um, those rules, um, did you come up uh, 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 with them on your own or did you seek for input uh, when you wrote, wrote them down or how did, how did you, yeah? Um, it's mostly my own but while we were three or four of, the, of us at the start to, and we discussed uh, we discuss them together, so I've, I have uh, some experience with, fo uh, well, with funding and was uh, problematic within the community because I was involved in Dunk Tank at that time. Uh, and I did not want to make the same mistake, so I took some precaution. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I believe it's mostly my own. But uh, if Guido is not here, Wants to. So, this is one. Okay. So, also about your rules of conduct, you luckily so far you haven't had to get rid of someone who didn't want to leave. But do you have a already a prescribed, you know, transparent rules that you will follow if maybe some contributor keeps underperforming but they won't leave? You know, do you have a process that you can follow and say, well, you know, this is why we, we can ask you to leave for these reasons? You know, you can improved by this and if you don't do it within that, you know, something like that, do you have anything like that? Yeah, fortunately I did not have to do this yet, but I believe that if I were in this situation I would uh, probably seek uh, sort of confirmation among other paid contributors because we're really working like a, well, like a team. I mean, I usually make proposition and uh, uh, but uh, I tried really to to keep an administrative role mainly and not uh, fully, uh, even so I'm the decision maker in the administrative way, I try to delegate the decision. And even for when we looked for external partners, uh, I did not do that work myself. I asked uh, a few of the pet contributors to look up. And for example, Guido uh, contacted the, the Xen community manager who then directed us to two or three companies that we contacted and then we decided together which one to pick. So, so in other words, it's not something, well, I guess, I'm trying to see how this would compare to a normal work culture because in a, you know, in a company, if someone has to be fired or whatever, you have a process, but it's, it's quite internal. You know, it's not, it's not transparent necessarily, whereas here, transparency is a goal, but at the same time, getting rid of someone is a very sensitive thing. So I, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how to handle this in a manner that looks transparent enough but kind of isn't 
unnecessarily public or embarrassing for anyone? Well, it, I, it would not be public. It would. We have an, uh, an internal alias uh, that we use for to communicate, and uh, if any discussion needs to happen, it will happen on this alias, not public. And uh, oh, since we are only uh, the relationship between the pet contributor and friction is only a uh, uh, well invoice and I pay invoice, so it's, there is no formal contract and there is no uh, fees fee to be paid if you breach the contract or whatever. So uh, we can decide rather quickly if we have to stop working together without any consequences, at least on our side. Um, <coughs> technically, this is not Debian money, and it's not people paid by Debian. Um, so I suspect there might be an impact on when you look for external people to contribute money, because they contribute money for a company that happens to pay people that happen to do work on Debian. Have you considered mm, having this be a TO, um, or even having the, the fundraising part being Debian and Debian paying, being paying contributors? Or do you think it would have an effect? I mean, it's, it's two questions, basically. It's A, does it have an impact on fetching money? And B, should the money be Debian money, actually? Well, <laughs> it's true. It's a multiple level question. But um, uh, you can find people uh, who, on both sides of the principle. I mean, uh, I got some criticism because while well, it's outside and we're using the Debian trademark in some way. But this is uh, not off well semi on the officially endorsed because well when we started this it was it has been published in a press release that was at the time approved by Luca. So while there's no formal contract uh, of uh, telling us you have the right to use the Debian trademark in this way. I made a request to the trademark team, said okay you're only referring to something related to Debian, it's, uh, it's not a, it's a usage that is authorized and not forbidden. Uh, so it's sort of okay. Uh, but it's true that uh, in the eyes of sponsors, uh, we, clearly, uh, we clearly put the Debian trademark uh, forward. I mean, it's Debian contributors who are paid to work on Debian. So really Debian related and most of the sponsors are fine with this uh, but a few of them asked questions anyway and for example for instance Gandhi was a sponsor the, the first year and not the second year because well they prefer to give money directly to FBI Debcorp whatever and not uh, through uh, to a company uh, I'm don't care either way what I care is that LTS uh, gets done and uh, so if uh, a trusted organization wants to take this over I'm fine with it if we want to continue to do it externally or so uh, and we have people who believe that it's best done e outside with a clear trademark agreement and there are people who prefer would prefer to do it inside that uh, will be a topic for this afternoon uh, buff I guess Okay, we have um, time for one more question. Uh, just a very short one, actually. Um, are there any non-paid volunteers working on LTS? And if not, do you think that's a problem? Are there non-paid contributors, you mean? Okay. Yeah, are there non-paid contributors? I mean, also people who do not work on their own packages, but work on LTS as a whole, but are not paid for it. Are there any such volunteers? And if not, uh, do you think that is a problem? Uh, there are a few. But uh, at least listed on the Teams page. Uh, they were really interested, at least at the start. But they are not, no longer so, so active. Um, I, I'm not sure if it's a problem. Uh, it might be a problem in the sense that we have pet contributors who are not always deeply interested in the generic LTS policies. And when you ask questions on Debian LTS list, uh, so what should we do here in terms of uh, support of this or this? Well, Fed contributors do not always have an opinion, whereas volunteers tend to have an opinion because they are really interest, interested. So that would be the main downside. 
the fact that they are not doing security updates on their own is not so much of a problem. But the fact that we have few people, uh, well, I would say at the management level, who are interested in, uh, in policies of the LTS team here, it's, it's a bit more of a problem. Cool. Well, thanks a lot. And thank you for the question.